Howdy, leadership scholars, and welcome back to ALEC 618. We are starting our module on norming. So congratulations, right? You're almost halfway through the session, which is crazy. You're almost halfway through your modules and learning about team development. So you have formed, right? You've gotten your, your team together. You understand each other. You're working towards that mission. You've stormed, you've weathered the, um, the conflict. You have learned more about how to work with each other. You've learned how to facilitate the process and make decisions. And now you've come into the norming stage. So just as a reminder, the norming stage, or we also call it the harmonious cohesive stage, is where there is a free exchange of ideas, feelings, and feedback. So think about it, right? You know each other, you've worked through some conflict, you've talked about decision making. So now you can actually work together in a better way. There are social needs of your team and you know that about each other because of group member roles about how you deal with conflict. And those social needs are just as important as the task needs as getting the project done or working towards getting the project done. Really, I love this idea of cohesion, common spirit, and common goals. If you want to call them the three C's of the norming. So again, that's cohesion, common spirit, and common goals. This is the stage where things are just gelling, right? You're working. You are feeling the fact that you have these common goals that gives you a sense of purpose, that gives you a sense of place. You have some maintenance of those rules and boundaries that you created during the forming and then reinforced during the storming stage. And we're gonna talk about actually your next uh, mini module or mini session is about that idea of group think. So I won't jump into that too much, um, but that's what we're focusing on, right? This week is how do we actually do the things? How do we get to effective norming? What does that look like? So looking through this, there's a couple of authors that have written extensively about how do you get through, not not just get through this stage, that sounds bad, um, because we're always trying to get to that, that actually performing stage, but how are you successful in the norming stage? So one of them, uh, or actually two of them, Larson and LaFasto um, have a great book. Um, it's called When Teams Work Best, I like it a lot. It's not, I don't have it for you guys as a textbook um, because it's old. Um, it's like me, it's old. So I wanted to kind of just give you these three things that they talk about because I think they're pretty essential when we talk about that norming phase. So this first idea of team management practices. So again, if we're trying to co concentrate on the people and the task part of what a team is, we've got to understand, right? We have to understand how to set direction, how to align the effort, and then how to deliver those results. So all of these things are, are different processes that we need to think of when we're in that norming stage. And the reason why I like Larson and LaFosto's um, kind of take on this is because they say that clarity drives confidence, which drives commitment. And that's what norming is about, clarity, confidence, and commitment. So in this management practices, when you're thinking about clarity, you have to think about that overarching goal. What is the direction that the team is going? When we think about strategic priorities for achieving whatever goal it is your team has come up with. So you know when you do goal setting, and I'm not going to go over that because you guys are adults, you've done SMART goals, right? And those of you that are leadership majors or, or took a couple leadership classes already in your undergrad or, or graduate work, you know that, you know, SMART goals, well, you, you've, you've been all over that. So there are big goals for a team and there are some micro goals, right? Macro and micro. And so being able to say, these are our strategic priorities for micro goals is really important. Being clear about resources, 
what are our resources? What resources do we have? What resources can we get, right? And then looking at operational principles. So going back to maybe that team contract, going back to that idea of setting up your organizational culture. So as a team, what are our principles? So if you've got clarity on those things, that drives confidence. And so for these practices, what that looks like is the leadership and the direction of the team has forward momentum which man, that's so important. Have you ever been stuck in a team project or a group project that just doesn't have forward momentum? Everyone has these great ideas, but nothing is getting done. That is so frustrating, right? So if you've got that forward momentum, then you get to that commitment and you're committed to delivering those results. So we talk about structure and processes for the team. Those are the things that facilitate the best decisions as quickly as possible by people who are in the know, right? We talked about conflict. We talked about there are some people that their voice needs to be heard because they have the information. And sometimes those are the voices that don't get listened to, maybe because they're introverts or they just don't pipe up and say much. When we talk about groupthink, we're going to talk about the necessity of making sure that everyone's voice is heard. So for Larson and LaFasto, what they say about clarity for structure and processes is that everyone is clear about those roles and responsibilities. So we're going back to group member roles, right? Everyone understands what is your role? What is your lane? How can I help you stay in that lane to get where we're going? The participation in decision-making processes, what does that look like? So again, going just back to storming. Have you made the decision on how you're going to make decisions? Have you had those conversations? Do you have those structures and processes in place? And the organization's performance about key issues. So thinking about your team and what are the key issues that have to be addressed in order to reach those goals? So if you've got clarity on those things, then again, it leads to confidence, confidence in thinking and acting the best interest of the team. So if you've got really good processes in place in the norming, in the norming stage, then you are going to do what's in the best inference of your team, not necessarily you as an individual or someone else on your team as an individual, but collectively as that team. And the commitment that this looks like identifying, raising, and resolving all issues that can affect the success of the organization. So you know how you're going to storm. If conflict comes back up, because it will, you know, that's one thing that people don't get. Um, sometimes you just backslide and you go back into the storming stage. But if you know how now, if you've got a good process of conflict resolution in place, you're only in storming for a hot minute and then you just move forward, right? It's so much easier. And then systems, so again, systems providing that useful information and drive all that behavior towards the re desired results, the goals, whatever you want to call it as a team. Here, the clarity is about, again, making decisions, monitoring results as well, being clear about policies, being clear about rewards or punishments. So going back to maybe that team contract, going back to those norms that you set up. How are we rewarding good behavior? How are we punishing? We'll talk in the next module about motivation, but it's that idea of how do we keep each other motivated, right? What is the system that we're using? And that drives the confidence and the confidence being not only relationship oriented, but for this one, really fact-based current knowledgeable teammates knowing how to get things done according to the standards the team has already put together which drives this idea of commitment which is running an organization or running a team that makes fact-based decisions right so you could always back it up with data aligns system and standards with the desired outcomes and is in sync internally and with the organization broadly, and even depending on what your context is, maybe the marketplace or government regulations or whatever, that kind of bigger sphere your team is working in. So how do you actually get and do all three of these things, have good team management practices, understand the structure and processes, and understand the systems that help us make all of these decisions? Well, how you do this is effective communication. So all the underlying 
I think, when it comes to norming. The underlying current of information is, are we communicating well? Are we communicating well our facts? Are we communicating well our relationships? Are we communicating our goals, our struggles? Are we being truthful and transparent? Do we still have trust? All of that goes back to communication. But guess what, y'all? We're bad at communication. I mean, I'm a talker. Communication is like one of my my strengths on strengths-based leadership, right? But sometimes even people like me (laughs) have some miscommunication. Y'all, I do it all the time, probably on a daily basis. Don't ask my husband. Okay, so think about it this way. A lot of times in teams and in life, and because we are all studying a graduate degree, right? And so sometimes we're a bit too erudite for our own good. Sometimes we say things like this, especially in academic writing, y'all. In the absence of the feline race, certain small rodents will give themselves up to various pleasurable pastimes. Now, doesn't that sound smart? Doesn't that sound academic? That sounds like it needs to go in an impact factor journal. But what are we actually saying there? In the absence of the feline race, certain small rodents will give themselves up to various pleasurable pastimes. Well, more colloquially, that is, When the cat's away, the mice will play, right? Sometimes we take a simple concept and we just make it so complicated. And that gets in the way of truly norming as a team. Okay, I'm going to give you another one because these are fun. The warm-blooded class Aves, who is governed by promptitude, can apprehend the small, elongated, and slender creeping animal. Have you guessed it? Are you already already looking at your PowerPoint slides? If so, you've ruined it. Okay. Okay. The early bird gets the worm, right? The same thing said in a much more complicated way. That doesn't help teams, right? We need to make sure that we are getting a clear message out because communication is a process. To me, it's kind of like leadership, right? Leadership is a process. Communication is a process. Information is... And I love this next part, and understanding are transferred between a sender and a receiver. So many times we only do the first, right? We only concentrate on the information, but we don't check for that understanding. Did you actually understand what I was trying to say? Did I say that in a clear way? How can I rephrase that to where it would be clearer? And so we have to think about ourselves as the sender, We have to think about who is receiving it and how the message is crafted. Um, I had, oh, this was several years ago, um, but I was teaching a online, I think it was my undergrad theory class. It was a summer class, completely online, right? Completely asynchronous. And so the only way that I could get in touch with students was via email. That's all that I had of their information. And so I had one student who, he logged in a couple of times, but he didn't take his first test and he didn't turn in his first paper. So finally, um, I figured out that one of the students was a friend of his and I was in contact with that other student. I know this is a convoluted story. I'm talking about communication. And so I had sent that other student an email and I was like, hey, I think you know, we'll call him Steve. I think you know Steve. Um, Can you please tell him to email me? I need to speak to him. It's very urgent. So I did finally get an email from Steve and I ended up saying, hey, just give me a call. And so he called me and I was like, man, you haven't logged, like you've logged in once, but you haven't done your test. You haven't done your paper. Like you're not going to pass this class. Like what can I do? We need to get you key dropped. And he said, yeah, I don't check email. And I said, oh, Steve, I understand that. But when you're taking an online class and that's legitimately the only way I can get in touch with you, you got to check your email. And he said, look, students don't check email. You guys know that because they send too much crap through AM's email. And I'm like, no, no, I get that. I get as much crap as you do. But again, this is the only way I can communicate with you. And so he said, well, you should probably just snap me instead. And I was like, yeah, I'm probably not going to Snapchat my kid or my students, but maybe, I mean, that's, that's an idea. 
but it was just this really interesting aha moment. Now from that, I said, okay, next semester, what can I do differently? So I had students sign up for the Remind app. And if you're not familiar with that, um, it started with elementary schools, and but higher education can use it too. And it's where you can, as an instructor, push out a text message to your students. Now it's got some limitations, like you can't, I think it's only a hundred, <laughs> you can only have a hundred enrolled. And so for some of my classes, I can't use it because they're too big. But I thought, okay, all right, if that's, if a text message will work for communication better, let's do it that way. And it's great because it doesn't go back to like my cell number. I'm not saying I don't want my undergrads to have my cell number, but I don't want my undergrads to have my cell number. Um, so it, it, it worked out for the next couple of semesters. I used that and actually I had more participation in class. So. Steve's um, inability to communicate via the way that I thought I had to with him actually kind of opened my eyes to a different way to communicate. I had to figure out how do I send that message in a different way that the receiver could actually more readily access it. Does that make sense? And I know you probably have a million different um, examples of when communication goes bad, right? Especially in a team. So why is it important that we talk through this? And why is it kind of that cornerstone of norming? Is we spend 80% of each day in communication with others. I honestly think that that 20, other 20% is um, sleeping. I, I think we're always communicating. Um, even when we're sitting and you know watching TikTok or doing whatever, someone is sending us a message right through that social media stream. Um, and so I think that's, it, I think the numbers may be a little bit big, bigger if we take um, out that idea of, of sleeping, communicating with yourself, right? Anybody talk to yourself, not out loud or even, or even out loud, there's no judgment, um, but we communicate a lot. And so if 80% of our day is spent communicating, then that's 80% of our day that it can go wrong, <laughs> right? That we really need to concentrate more on that idea of communication because group team discussion depends on how well that information is passed, right? If you turn, if it turns into a game of telephone, we all know how that ends. At the end of the line, the message is so distorted that you cannot figure out what's going on. And that causes problems. And again, I know you probably have examples of this. Here's another example of when I really wish we had live class so we can talk through some of these and laugh and learn from each other from some of these. So it is important. Communication is essential when you are norming. So what are some skills? You know, because I love skills because skills are things that you can practice and you can improve in order to be a better teammate. So if we are going again on working towards cohesion, common spirit, and common goals of norming, these are four things that you can do. First, ask questions. Ask questions if you don't understand what someone is saying. If you have moved past forming and storming, you're not falling prey to not trusting each other, you're willing to be vulnerable with each other, you can ask questions. There are no such thing as a dumb question. They may not be phrased correctly, but they're not dumb. If you don't understand, say, I'm not quite sure what you meant by that. Can you rephrase it for me? And when we say things like that, boy, it just, it feels weird, right? Or I didn't understand what you were saying or even going and now I'm saying, I feel like I'm, I'm in a counseling session. What I heard you say was this, is that what you meant? right? Really kind of slowing down the conversation and truly getting meaning. And that's where you can really ask questions the most, I guess it benefits everyone the most at that point. Active listening is another skill. Um, if you hear things, but don't really listen to them, um, that could be a problem for you. And that's because our brain processes so much faster than our mouths can speak words. So we're ahead in our brain a couple of thoughts after what that person is saying. So if you've had a conversation, usually an argument is where this pops out the most. You kind of stop listening and you start formulating your own defense. Um, you really have to stop what you're doing and truly focus on that person. So that's putting down your phone, um, that's turning off the TV, that's whatever it is to truly focus on what that person is saying. Giving constructive feedback is really good for communications. If it is 
constructive feedback and not complaining or whining or tearing somebody down or just straight up being ugly, if you are truly giving constructive feedback, you're going to get better communication from the sender and you as a receiver. So you have to make sure that you are engaging in that way. That's part of communication. And managing feelings, oh, Y'all, I'm terrible at this one. I cry when I'm happy. I cry when I'm sad. I cry when I'm angry. I just cry all the time. And I don't mean to be a basket case when it comes to this, but I have low emotional intelligence. And so if I'm in an intense conversation, tears may come. And it's it's not because I'm I'm sad. It's just because I'm I'm so in the moment. And you know, people are scared by tears. I'm going to overgeneralize here for a second and say men. Men are scared of tears. And so it completely shuts down, right? They shut down and then you're like, I need you to actually give me something. And they're like, no, I'm not going to give you anything because you're crying. You're being an overly emotional woman, you know, whatever it is. So managing those feelings. Also, not having a tricky uh, or a hair trigger um Oh, shoot. I'm trying to say colloquialism. Communication is hard, right? Words are tough. Just don't jump off the deep end real fast, right? Having a, um, okay, y'all are all yelling at your computer what I'm trying to say right now, aren't you? Just don't go off on people. Um, sometimes our anger is just so at the surface, right? Especially if we are not working through conflict. And so someone comes along and says something and it just is that straw that breaks the camel's back and you just like explode on them. Well, that's not managing your feelings either. So really that idea of having a high emotional intelligence increases your ability to communicate. There we go. See, words aren't as hard as I thought. <laughs> Or maybe they are. Okay, so as we continue with norming, again, we're going to talk about groupthink. Um, you've got a fun video to watch for this next time. And we'll move into also, how do you be creative in a team? So the norming stage, fun one, one not to be missed. Catch you later.